legacy work. So it's a good change for all of us. So welcome all of you. And uh, maybe a small intro about myself. Um, I've been in this uh, IT industry for roughly 23 years now. And the passion for training has been growing ever since then it was in the beginning. And uh, uh, that's the whole idea of uh, we are spinning out this Venture Age Technologies India Private Limited. And uh, we all, you know, want to contribute and see if we can make some uh, collaborative effort and, you know, um, bring bring the, you know, the, the skills uh, out of every... So that's uh, about a brief on me. Maybe we can keep knowing about this later. Uh, folks, so I think without wasting much of the time, I will be, you know, uh, starting up the session and I will request you guys to mute yourself. And uh, if you have any question, you can place it on the chat window or unmute yourself sometime. Uh, okay. okay. And, <clears throat> and, and Mesh, do you mind recording this session? Yeah, it's getting recorded. And I'm, yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I will have uh, something for the plate for you guys. So, all right, I've been in, in this. So let's get started for today's topic. You know, modern C++ is something which is uh, more in limelight. And, uh, and, you know, I think if you look around the products which you have been building, uh, there has been a huge backend based processing from uh, C++ perspective. So if you look at the legacy C++ programs and design, which we call it as the programs for 98 and before, and if you can look at the code after 2011, there has been a serious adaptation of the changes. So modernization was a need and C++ has adapted that so, this is just level. Uh, so uh, I think people can mute themselves getting disturbed. Yeah, who's that? Mubarak, can you look into muting yourself? Take an admin for them. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, the whole idea is you know, to, to also understand the way you know, most of the companies are working. Majority, when you look at a C program, uh, you know, C is an uh, instant. Inheritance in 1991, I think there was one kind of a modernization it did when it was seeing Java coming out. And it was in 1984 while NC was being, you know, standardized, you had C++ coming up at that same time, you know. So there are two uh, important timeline where, you know, Strasbourg was very you know, open to the adaptation and modernization. And <clears throat> It was quite a vacuum after 1998. So most of the time we were looking at writing a C++ style code in C and getting the job done for monolithic architecture. And uh, I think somebody is uh, not muting himself. Yeah. 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 So on modernization, you know, uh, you can see a functional programming language becoming a very, you know, uh, challenge and what, what has happened because of this PC era to an internet era, you have a lot of connected systems and all of them pumping a lot of data. And you know, today the entire environment in the last 15 years have become very, very, you know, um, attractive to the data related technologies. So whether it's a billion dollar, you know, social platforms or whether it is uh, analytical or BI applications for a B2B organization, data is being driven everywhere. and to, to ensure that all these structured and unstructured data are well handled. A lot of new technologies is trying to, you know, get an insight over it. So functional programming language like Python and uh, other language provides a huge, um, you know, advantage to all, all, all uh, quick prototyping. But, you know, when it comes to speed, I think uh, C++ really takes that over. And uh, let's, let's look into, you know, some of the uh, modernization briefing of these. So I want to talk about, you know, some of the inbuilt features of uh, C++ and one of them is that supports the entire object orientation. 
So it's possible for you to ensure that you can use the coupling of the coding. When I say object, we say that we have a way via which we have data and methods bound together. And hence, you know, you have a coupling of the code going on. When you say coupling, then it, it talks about very nice way of organizing your code, which is relevant. So when you write a function, looking at the function, you can know that, okay, which is the data structure is gonna act. So in C, we used to have a set of function pointer and then function pointer was wrapped around with say, you know, um, you could think of um, wrapping around with function pointer and data together and then calling as an interface to talk. So that was a manual way of you, you representing an object. So something which is inbuilt. <clears throat> very possibly you can know that, you know, C is a very strong type check language and uh, you know, there are various way functions are supported. In fact, now we have lambdas also supported, which talks about anonymous function, allows us a different way of callback mechanism for a lot of algorithms. So that's a very catchy thing. It's a good competition to, to get in with other functional programming language like Scala or Python or any other language. Yeah. Another thing which you'll notice is C++ supports references. You know, it's a little less powerful than pointers and less vulnerable. I mean, that's the whole idea that, you know, you, you can be more type safe than being, you know, not type sorry, I would say like that. And, you know, references is an alias to an existing object. So you always guarantee that that's the object which I'm referring it to, you know, so that's an awesome thing. You can also look at large code bases, you know, the C++, like whether you look at the Google search built on C++, if you look at Facebook, do you know what is the top technology Facebook is using? Number one language. Absolutely, C++, second highest used language, PHP, and there are bundles of Next. So, you know, what I'm not trying to say is that, you know, you talk about any JP Morgan or any financial company in the background, on the top you might be hearing blockchain and other stuff, or the background inside you see C++. You talk about any gaming engine outside there, and talk about C++. You talk about machine learning stuff and AI building, the platform and background is C++. In fact, they are opening up applications and structure for Python, Java, and others. But when it comes to compile time, hardware-based acceleration to native advantage, I mean, C++ stands out. Yeah, it imposes a lot of challenges for, you know, learning curve as well. But you can think, hey, if you learn Scala, it's just completely new learning altogether, including syntaxes and uh, structure or Go, but uh, it's easy for you to migrate from a popular language like C uh, to C++. So, not the easy, but it's uh, re relatively easy. That's an assumption. Yeah, so you know, when, when you have a large code base, the biggest problem is, you know, handling and falling short of names. So you like the same name and I like the same name. And when you try to build the application together, we all fall short, you know? So mainly this happens when you are building some utility or libraries for end user, you know? And libraries and utilities are always going to be updated. So maintaining the versioning of them and then talking about their own uh, uh, uses where you, you are also happy using your namespaces and others. Um, C++ added this concept in 1991, you know, and the whole idea of them was to have packaging concepts, a very good thing, you know, having a global scope, you wrap everything inside, nobody worries about each other, everybody uses the same variable name, they use a unique packaging name concept and live happily. Very strong feature for large code based maintenance. I'm going to talk definitely a little bit detail on this. Another jealous language uh, feature in C++ is templates. And why are you more jealous? Because you have an, two very, very strong library. One is standard template library, which is STL. And the second one is ATL, which is your advanced template library. And the third one is your boost library. You know, it's a licensed boost library. In fact, uh, all the stunts are tried out in Boost and then it's proposed in standards. And, you know, most of the time they are accepted to be a part of Stool. So, you know, it's a good idea to, if you can focus on some upcoming uh, stunts, which is a part of new TR, you can look at um, Boost and then you can come back to, you know, templates. So it allows you to write generic programming. Yeah, there are some kinds of, you know, challenges when you face in dynamic polymorphism. So a lot of, you know, languages support these inbuilt, you know, the dynamic polymorphism. And C++ is an optional thing. You can enable, you know, most of the time, 
people come out with saying, hey, I don't know the kind of objects I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get uh, as an ex from an external world, and I don't have a case for that, then I think that's the wrong direction you're going. Most of the time when we design a plugin, we are absolutely sure about the kind of objects or services which can, we can provide. So doing it without an RTK is an awesome stuff, but otherwise, if you know the types and you know the cases, uh, challenges, how do you get to know at the runtime, you know? So runtime type identification or RTTI is the best way to perform the DAP. They do by using type ID and type name. You can compare two objects at runtime and you can take appropriate, you know, call decisions or, you know, mapping of the services which you think in your plugin will make sense or in code base. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you have very critical application, fine, you don't need to work on exception handling, but uh, if you think that these applications will not cause serious side effects and you have a chance for restarting the application once or twice, if something unknown arrives, you know, if something unknown arrives, exception handling is a good feature uh, to try on there. Uh, though you, you don't practice in extremely critical environment, uh, but uh, good stuff to have. A lot of uh, design of STL is also something very unique, which talks about decoupling of the system. So I've just placed both of them, you know, each after. So if you look at uh, the design of, uh, you know, the object orientation feature, they talk about the concept of coupling. And we look at the STL design, then they talk about, you know, decoupling, where, you know, the algorithms and uh, data structures are completely, or containers are completely agnostic to each other. They provide an interface like iterator where you talk to each other. That's a awesome stuff. So it reduces the implementation. So what we are trying to say is when you write a couple code, it's good for arrangement and understanding the contextual requirement. But there are scenarios where you need to write algorithms which will be agnostic to data, you know. So SL design is a lot about that. Absolutely, I'm going to talk about this in some time. And um, one sec, sorry, folks. Yeah. So coming back to, you know, the programming C++ with STL is something which people do not often do because, uh, you know, they tend to see that they can do it themselves. So one of the strong requirements for all of us in C++ feature knowledge is that how good are you at STL programming, you know, and that talks it all about in modern uh, languages. So the more you're aware about the utilities provided at STL, the more demanding you are. You know. Until 2020, no, sorry, 10, you know, there was no support for concurrency. It means C++ by default was a process-based architecture, just like C. When I say process-based, I mean, you know, it, it is all about single core based execution. And we used to rely on, you know, the third party or some kind of a native library by which we could do multi-threading or multi-processing. So, you know, Concurrency in C++ was not inbuilt, but in 2011, C++ came out with a new memory model, and that also in turn gave a strong, you know, uh, way of modernizing C++. So concurrency is a very strong thing. You could easily use a stood thread, and you can spawn and write you know, multi-core based applications. So this is a good target. It has come out late. You, will, I will agree that you know, if you look at 1995 to 1999. Uh, Java was the fastest growing language at the time. And looking at it, uh, C++ was trying to be around C. His mo motive was more of to compete only around C and, and they couldn't uh, force it. Uh, and then, you know, Java took over the world by storm at the time, you know. And uh, understanding the importance of modernization and uh, distributed architecture programming, I think this concurrency was a need of an R, new memory model with a flexible model. I think C++ stands out there. You'll also see that, you know, they have also introduced you something called as memory orders and atomics, which is a fantastic thing to use. You know, most of the time in write concurrent codes, you will see that you're stuck in this lock-based programming. So most of the time you're busy mutexing lock, unlock, and conditional variable and whatnot. So, you know, we introduce, we take advantage of RAM, but we introduce the, the programming problem of blocking. So, you know, uh, having too many spins for a shared memory can, can cause up a very bad uh, responsive behavior for an application. So, you know, atomics and memory are by which you can write certain instruction without having any sequential disorder. 
when I say sequential disorder, I mean, you know, in process oriented language, it's possible for you to guarantee that, you know, there is a sequence of execution which will always take place. But that's not anymore in concurrent programming because, you know, compilers, architecture and hardware will influence your code to reorder or restructure itself uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, yeah, in terms of uh, <clears throat> the, the model. So, you know, atomic uh, and memory order allows you to play a little bit around and ask compiler or hardware to do some stuff in a very specific way. So very good for hardware designers. So if you look at Broadcom, Intel, Texas, ARM, they're heavily building their design simulation on C++, you know. All the, the work which they do, they do it in C++. And, uh, and, and then they have a design testing. Once it works out, they model it on a QEMU. And then once the QEMU is all out, then they give you an actual fab. So, you know, what happens is while the parallel development is going on, even applications are being tested. So while the hardware comes out, it, it is uh, almost uh, your rapid uh, prototyping is already done, you know, bef without you having a hardware to, uh, to have with you. So, you know, hardware engineers use this concurrent memory model and atomics to a larger extent. Again, in modern C++, you'll find Lambda to be very useful, though I will not be able to cover all of them today. It's one of the very nice features where you can write nested functions within a particular context. In 2020, you will be finding a new concept called as containerization or co-modules coming up and you write nice models where each models can be imported from each other without having you to include this header and other stuff. And something very new which you'll find is type inference, which helps you out in connecting the code. So, you know, there are scenarios where you cannot pre-decide the particular type of data. Usually when you use templates, there are certain expression which needs to be resolved you know, at the time of uh, compilation, and then only you can decide the type. So usually you work on something like, you know, const uh, uh, expressions and also, you know, talking about, uh, hello, yeah, I think there is some disturbance. Yeah, so I was talking about type inference where, you know, you cannot decide the type on your own, rather you need to delay the type handling and type inference works there. So it's a nice feature to have. Also C++ comes out with a concept where you know you can reuse your temporaries. So there's a concept called as RVAL or move construct by using this, some use cases like perfect forwarding, you know, having one interface which can work for all the possible type passing and having influenced the, you know, compilers to ensure that you know, the, the entire expression is evaluated at compile time, you know, so const EXPR is a breathtaking and only the feature in C++ right now, which can guarantee that certain expressions can be evaluated with its final value at compile time. Of course, it will have a build time abuse. What I mean by this is that you may take a lot of time to build, but um, the output will be zero, you know, latency based. So that's something which is really interesting, folks. All right, so by giving an overview of C++, today we are only going to take some quick examples on namespace. I'll give you an overview of how STL design is, and then we'll talk about concurrency in C++. And, uh, you know, without wasting much of your time, I will quickly get into the uh, uh, popularity of namespaces and the way you can make use of namespace. And uh, these are some slides which you can refer about the transitions of the standards. So you can talk about the core features by which we have been changing in your you know, uh, standard timelines. So this presentation will be available to you after the session where we can talk about you know, uh, all the leftover uh, newnesses. However, let's talk about one small build. Uh, most of the time my builds will be on G++ here or Clang. I'm using a Mac and you can use any of your uh, uh, you know, uh, compilers and it should be working fine. And uh, let's start with something like a standard way of you writing a program and so taking the switch. So let's talk about first writing a specific standard program. And this is the first program which I'm trying to display. I hope everybody can see the screen. Mubarak, can you assert? Mubarak, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, we could able to see the screen. Yeah. 
All right. So see, we talk about something which is very interesting called as underscore underscore C++. And that talks about a macro which talks about the standard value for every standards. So whenever you compile a program, you use a typical switch by which a certain standards get say, recognized. So the moment I say, for example, C++, my file name is standard or C++. Notice I haven't used any switch. And if I run and result is 1997. 11. It means 11th of November 1997 is the place or the month where 98 standards was accepted. Similarly, if I use the different switch for this particular program, say stood assigns C11, and now the result is 2011th of March. So, this is a very interesting thing by which you can have an E for else. Folks, please switch off. Uh, can you, you know, like mute yourself? If you're not. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah. So you can see if you're talking about C 14, and then you have something like 2014 or Feb, and then you have, if your compiler is compatible to 17, then it shows you even 17. And if you have something like 20, which I guess right now not, but 2x, you can see here, or 2a. And it can compile for even 20. So it will, it might give you some results based on that. Uh, right now it is the 7th of July, 2017, which was the last edited value for 2020 standards. So this is very interesting for all of you because when you compile some modern compilation of the program, you should know that these are extremely important switches which can help you to compile those features. Otherwise compiler will not recognize them. Just to set you an example, if I were to use a variable, say an integer, and if I want to initialize that by a syntax like this, is an example of a modern way of initializing a variable to zero, which is not going to be compiled on a normal switch. Because an example of what? You can see it says an error, but this is an example of a brace initialization technique in 11. So we are supposed to use the switch of C++ 11 so that your program can pass out. So I think you got the idea about how advantageous it could be. So tomorrow, if you are having some, you know, programs, some parts which has to run on older version, so you can write if underscore underscore C++ is equal to 1997, 03 and, or 11, sorry, or if it is something else and say, so you can have conditional aspects by which some parts of the program can be modernized and some part can be left, left at legacy, you know, uh, unlike if I were an uh, old programmer, then classically I will use the initialization technique of assignment, which is an implicit type conversion technique, and that shouldn't be requiring any switch or is to build, fair enough, yeah. So you can see even with 11 is fine, but, uh, you know, forward compatibility not possible. Yeah, now the most important thing for today's section is to understand about the namespaces. So I think everybody knows what's a namespace, right? As I said, you, the whole idea of namespace is to, to enable the, the, you know, falling short of a name collision problem, you know? So let's say, can we do that with a standard? So I will take a very simple example, namespace write or CPP. And folks, first I'm gonna comment this all so that you don't uh, look at this code base. And, uh, yeah, so let me quote comment this and let me come out here and let's talk about something else. I'm going to even comment this line and we'll just take a int main and we are going to use something like C out hello here Sunday. Could be interesting. Now my question to all of you, will this program compile? Anybody who wants to try this? What do you guys think? Should this compile? So somebody says yes, but uh, now you see the program failing to compile.
So Sekhar is right. See Sekhar. The whole idea for you to understand is that namespace is a global keyword. And when you say C out, you know, it's an object instance of a IO stream, which is inherited by O stream and I stream and then base class O stream. And then you have a left shift operator, which is an overloaded operator and it takes the string as a parameter, you know, and that's the default way why which a program is being seen. And the problem with compiler, it doesn't know what C out is, you know, because when you put a left shift operator, it thinks like, hey, it is nothing but something like a left shift activity. And I don't know what C out refers to, I cannot resolve this. However, there's something very interesting here. It says, did you mean to C out? So my question is now, how the hell the compiler can uh, understand and give me a hint about std c out. How does it know? What happened that he understands std is there? Folks, this is called as ADL. There's an idiom which is called as what? ADL. ADL stands for argument dependent lookup. What does it stand for? Argument dependent lookup. What does the argument lookup understands for is that you know compiler will have this by default enabled. So it finds and looks for an object existing. Yeah. It looks for the object which is existing. And then it finds a matching parameter for that. And he says that, I think, do you mean this? I'm not yet sure. You have to mention it. So argument dependent lookup is a Kony lookup. You know, in 1991, Henry Kony uh, joined forces with Strostra. And he says packaging is a very good thing. I think somebody has to mute themselves up. Yeah, thank you. So Henry Kony became the contributor for Kony lookup logic. Palinapon, you have to mute yourself. Thank you. Yeah. So now what happens is it gives you a hint because it's by default enabled. And now let's say if I say something like int C out. And then I can say something like, say, zero cross FF. Now you see in namespace, what's the idea? That the same variable name can be used. And now I'm going to say C out, left shift, two times. So how do I explicitly make use of this? I can always say package name, that is stood, C out, namespace, and then C out two. You'll be now, to see whether we can print them out. I can say again what? Stood, scope, C out, left shift, C out of this. In fact, I can further say stood, scope, end. So by having this explicit scope resolution operator, I ensure that all the variables with the similar names are accepted in my program. As you can see that both of them, Sunday could be interesting, and 255 tool is left shifted by two. So it's like, you know, 255, okay, is your FF that gets left shifted by, so it multiplies by two, and then the result of that further gets multiplied by two, and that's your result here as 2552, two. you know? So so that, that's fair enough. What we, that we're trying to see here, that even though you have a global variable with the same name, uh, I don't have any conflict and it's fair enough to use. Professionally, if you are writing a production level code, folks, you must use explicit name of the namespace. Now, let me be a little blunt over here. If I enable something like using namespace, it is not required, but it is a good shorthand sometimes for you. So instead of you using stood, 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 you might use some Something like C out here again. 
Now, if you notice the program over here, it has some challenge. The compiler immediately comes out and say, hey, ambiguous. It means what? The same ADL is now trying to perform the search. And he founds two matching. He says, see out is a variable which is integer type. And it's possible for you to left shift that as well, number one. Second, there is a C out which is an stood object type. Why? Because at line number four, I've enabled it. Hence, now I have got two versions. How do you, I resolve this? I cannot resolve this. You have to tell me whom do you want to refer. So an uh, easier way for you to find this out is just by using the stood school. So what are we seeing? The usage of line number four is good as long as you do not have any conflicting symbols. But it's a way to shout out. For example, the moment you have some other variables trying to raise up in your code base, you have to switch back to the packaging name concept. So by saying this, I would like to also tell that using keyword is a scope based. So I'm going to bring this down here. And I'm going to create a function here. Say do something. And then folks, what do I do? I'm going to go copy all this stuff from here. And then let's go line number HCP. So I'm pasting here. And I want to just take this one out and paste here and say something like this here. Okay, just for a moment, I want to shut this up so that there's no conflicting stuff for me. This is sufficient for you uh, to know that uh, I'm now trying to use a shorthand within my function to something. So I don't need to use stood right now explicitly. We all know that because there is no conflicts. There's a global variable which is sh shut off. It's commented. I have a, only using names to inside the do something function. And then I'm saying see out. So for sure now it's visible only within this function. So line number 10 is fine, but line number 18 still is an error. In this main, the scope is not visible. So that's the whole idea. When you compile the program, namespace space or packages can be scoped within a function. Now you think from the design perspective, it could be very interesting folks, right? See, if I have some package which has to be used, say there is a package which implements image-based algorithms and it performs a facial recognition. And now I have two methods or three methods in my code base where only those three functions should be able to access this package. So having a global usage of using namespace so can be more harmful because you will be opening all the methods and functions in that file which can have access. Unlike in this style, you will have illustrated that only do something is the one which is going to use stood. Rest all do not apply. So as the error arrives here at line number 18, they, hey, it makes sense, yeah. 18 is something which, which is really cool stuff, yeah. So good restriction, but not so like we cannot make use of it. Anybody who knows about the package can always call them by using what? An explicit scope resolution. But by having an implicit say, I said, did it, I not meant by this? And that's something, you know, which is very interesting in, in the namespace here. Now let's talk about something more doing on the namespace. Let's try to enable some more functionality. You know? So now I'm gonna use something like uh, a namespace within the namespace. Okay, so better construct this for you guys. We will use something like namespace, creating our own namespace, say OS. And then we will have this variable say in flag here. And then I can have a struct over here. I think I have a small example, which is doing this job here. Yeah, let me do this stuff here. Okay. You can save some time, we have a lot of stuff to cover in such a less time. Yeah. So if you notice, there is a uh, namespace must be global, but the exception to it is a nested namespace. Nested namespace is very nice for sub packaging and file system distribution. And now we'll talk about, say, there's a global method called as do something, you know, 
which you have already seen here. There is another variable which I'm going to introduce. Is going to be flag, say one. And in namespace OS, I'm going to say flag is two. And I'm also saying here that that could be a function here. So something, and I'll make this as OS. And imagine that if I were to call the global function here, I have a requirement, folks, that I want to make a call to the global function here. Call the global function. That's at line number six, if you notice. So there is a ditto, same name of the function there, line number six. What do you think will happen if I say do something here? Just the name. There's a kind of a recursion. Function will be calling itself, isn't it? So let's try to do that. I will be thinking about, say, OS scope, and then do something. That's how I'm gonna call. And that should be good for me in my namespace. And let's try this up, let's say dot slash, it out. You can see it becomes crazy, while I mean, that's not what I was looking for. It had a segmentation fault. If you look at program hits the set fault because of recursion. So how do I ensure that I want to call the global forms inside my another global function? That's the place where we use anonymous scope resolution. Anonymous scope resolution operator. I just prefix the anonymous scope resolution operator and it ensures it makes me call this function, which will print me, Sunday could be interesting. Let's look at that. Try and build this absolutely is what we expected. So to summarize, if you are using any global methods or variables or data inside your own package or namespace, currently, you can use anonymous scope resolution to call them within your own name, despite you have the same global function. You know, this, this is always going to occur when you try to use some pre-built legacy APIs or implementation. Assume that some uncle wrote some code for us 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and you, you want to reuse them. And unfortunately, the names have the same stuff. The prototype is also the same. And that becomes a very you know, critical aspect for all of us to think, you know. And why not uh, to, to convert that into something which can be very convenient? You know, I would like you guys to give you one more problem which namespace can really solve. Just trying to switch to the the, The empty screen. Can you guys see my screen here? Empty screen? Yes. Oh, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So assume that, you know, you guys are uh, there and we are building some application, say some app.exe. And I'm going to change this. Okay, hang on. 14. Then we have a bold here. And uh, let's name them so that, yeah, say app x.exe and then we have something like an app y dot n-e-x-e. Now the build from this app dot exe uses a runtime and here also you use a runtime. Now these runtimes are some libraries let's say that you know they use some uh, heavy lifting library like mucilipsy dot so file. And this guy is folks use a eglibc.so file. Unfortunately, this also has a functionality called as printf. Same parameters. And the same stuff is present over here also. 
Now, there is a need for this application to also make a call to this printf and also make a call to this printf. I don't care about this application. I'm talking about application Y as of now. That they are both on the same platform. And we are trying to see that now applications has to talk to each other. SO file means DLL. If you're a Microsoft fan, then we call it as dynamic link library. If you're a Unix fan, then we call it SO, which is shared object in this case. The problem is gonna be when you combine these two as a build time, you know, you will have multiple definition error. This cannot be solved. So imagine if I could restructure this kind of a program or if you start design my programs where we can namespace this, say uh, namespace v2 and uh, this can be a name space v1 then it's very easy for these folks to call v1 to printf and that's about it versus i can always say v2 scope printf this really solves so i think that's a wonderful stuff by using namespace we ensure you know at least uh, we are able to you know hit the the right places, uh, uh, the problems. So, you know, in modern application, when you write C++, C, you cannot touch the old legacy code. Either you will be in the project or somebody else will be out in the project. So legacy code means we don't touch it, right? We all know that. Legacy code means it's proven code, metal code, it is already running in the client. There's no need to finger it and spoil it, folks. The idea is, if you write modernization in your current application, Please prefer using namespaces. Think about the kids who are going to sit on your code base after five years, 10 years. How long are you gonna sit on a code base? One year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year. Somewhere, sometime, somebody else has to take over your code base. And that's the place where you would like to have set a platform right away by your practice that, you know, packaging concept starts prevailing and becomes easy for everyone to, you know, stay happy irrespective of the, you know, enlargement in the code space, right? I think that's working wonder in the environment. Okay, let me save this for a while and uh, stop sharing this and get into back to the terminal. Yeah. So I hope you guys can see the screen again back. I'm on the terminal. Yeah. The anonymous namespaces are a good one by which you can still call the legacy inside this function. Why? You wanted to build some wrapper on this program, you know. A wrappering concept is something which is really interesting for all of us. And uh, that's, that's the reason why, why you would like uh, people to intel on this and make use of uh, names. I think there's a lot of dropout, dropping, I don't know what's going on, folks. Anyway, let's focus on something which we call it as namespace it can also be split across the files. Oh, that's very interesting, you know. I want to show you something where, you know, standard namespaces are placed. Let me take you to something like a vector or some stuff like that, yeah. So I'm going to take one library. Mm -hmm. Not this one, not this one. You know, something which you can directly have a look at or maybe a stream. Yeah, so. I'll skip boost, I'll get into stood x86, yeah. Okay, no, 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 I don't need boost. I'm looking for a developer library which contains all this stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, I am almost to the command line to SDK. Mm -hmm. 
here we go. I got a command line. Yeah. I'm just looking for, I have a multiple version installed. So I just wanted to show you that. I'll open one more and switch to this stuff. Yeah. So this is the place where entire standard inclusions are based. So all the namespace. Error files. So let's look at something like vector. So the moment you say vector, you can see what it is. Namespace stood, open, close, and all the vector stuff. Let me show you some more. Like let's say I want to say memory. Namespace stood memory. So what are we noticing? That actually the package name is same in all these files. I'm not going to say thread anyway. We are going to use one example here. Namespace stood again thread is inside. So what is that we are trying to see is the namespace is actually split across all the files, correct? So if you have very large package management to be done, it's always good that you put it inside across the files and maintain the usage of it, you know? So I have one example to demonstrate that how you can, you know, package it out yourself in a file system structure and you can restrict or access certain parts of the implementation as and when required. For example, let's take the example namespace across files. Now, as you can see here, we are trying to include two different files called as TCP and IP. We have those files as well here. I'm gonna just uh, split that here and say TCP. And then I'm gonna use uh, split to IP. So, I think everybody can see now that there is the source where we have these namespaces out here. And uh, you know, what it says is uh, there is some struct inside and then we have a netlink nested namespace inside. You know, the IP is trying to consume the netlink uh, layer inside here. As you can see here, the idea is to see how netlink scope ICMP, something like that. So think somebody is working on a control layer, somebody working on a you know network layer or IP layer, and you know we want to only test on one of the side. So what we can do here is we can just comment one of the header here. So what I do is I'll just comment the TCP for a moment, okay, and I'll say just use the And now I'm going to build this program here and test this. How does it behave? Let's see. So I'm going to say G++, the file name six name square. As you can see directly, the error arrives. It says TCP error is unknown to me. And that's fair enough because I didn't include a TCP. See, this is what happens when you include a, do not include a vector and you want to use a vector. It just scripts, okay? Just let me show you this. If I want to say something like a vector of int, V and I want my compiler to hear about it. what I say. Hey, I don't know who is this vector. Okay. Second, he doesn't even know about the, the initialization technique 11 switch. So it's also creeping the syntax. Right. As you can see, it's not known to him. The compile time builds are actually denying it. So the moment I enable this TCP inclusion, you can see TCP and IP stuff both getting a result. Now Netlink is something which is giving us an error. The reason is order in which the packages are designed. If you notice, when I say TCP, TCP is being included first and then is IP. So it is in line. And the definition of netlink is much after the function call f is there. Compiler has detected it at compile time. So what he says is be very careful when you have to run this program. Ordering really matters. So the moment you expose your namespaces and sub packages inside, namespace ordering really matters a lot. That's the take on it. So you need to understand the dependency, you know. That's the reason why most of the developers sit along with the, the build team 
to understand the build hierarchy structure. Usually we don't see it actually. Nobody has time to look after. Everybody is busy fixing the bug by saying GDV file name, core file, enter and you know, keep moving around. But the actual fact is that having a very true knowledge of how my packaging distribution takes place is core for me in my design. You know, so my coding structure is heavily dependent on that. So folks, that's all about uh, uh, the brief on namespaces on these lines of uh, scattered files. I also have one more concept called as, you know, version maintenance. Of so I just want to explain you that as well. Namespace, uh, try CPP. So you can easily maintain various versions of uh, the system, you know. Now the problem here is everything you want to have an access to, you have to keep saying OS is scope, scope, and then you say RTOS, uh, scope, scope, and then you want to say RT underscore priority, you know, something like this. RT underscore priority, you know, something like this. Stood and uh, see how. I don't want to print this message, so I'm just reusing this decoration. Okay. Let's see. Intel. The thing is, this is fine. I mean, it will uh, build because just namespace try. As expected, it will give you the result, priority 100, tested. And now we want to talk about versioning maintenance. You know? The packages keep changing very often and you need to have a way to maintain it. So assume that we have OS. I'll give you some very nice fancy names over here. Let's take some TI underscore Intel, underscore Juni, underscore Cisco, uh, have joined together for a package utility. And we'll say that this is something like, you know, say V1, version one. And we're gonna use the same name here, folks. Again, but say V2. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say this is version one or two and maybe I don't need to even type that that means version one but maybe just for decoration version one as well now if this is one everywhere tomorrow if you have a program and you want to change this OS from uh, do something to manually what we need to do we need to say ti underscore something and then manually keep looking everywhere, wherever OS is, keep changing them with TI. I mean, this is very irritating. Suppose if you have 10 or five versions of the library and you have to keep testing the application across, it will be like crazy going out there, right? So what do we do? Actually, we use an aliasing concept, folks. What does it mean? It's, I don't use this logic at all. Rather, we use something like hash, if def, say v1, then you're going to say namespace. I create an alias, say current version. And that gets assigned to my ti underscore, say v1. else namespace current version assigns to ti v2 and then say end end and now whenever i use an os then i start using the current version that's very very useful folks by just saying this you know current version you don't need to change the entire code, rather just package naming. So if I build, by default, I haven't defined V1. So what should be the result? V2. As you can see, the result says it's V2. 
Now, if I wanted to try a V1, I can give a build switch, say dash D V1. And now my build is what? Notice V1. Awesome. So you can keep playing with testing your application across version without having to undergo the entire you know, changes in the code basis. Here it might look very tricky and trivial because we are just working for a replacement for once or twice. So you can say that, hey, I don't mind typing. But the moment you get into your real code basis, uh, you know how weird it becomes, you know. So batting for aliasing of namespace which is a very interesting aspects of uh, packaging versioning system. So that's roughly about namespace. I am sure that you guys got some brief overview about namespace. And if you have any questions, remember that it's a compile time activity. So there is no penalty at runtime or something. Everything gets decided before an object file is created. Fair enough to include them all, right? So if you have any questions, you can keep placing on the chat window. Otherwise, we'll get to the next concept, okay? That's the design of STL. Ready for it? So let me see the chat window. Cool, everybody's sleeping, let's go next, bye-bye. All right. So you understood, just to summarize, that you know, it's the Koenig lookup which has added this kind of a magic by which the application can interact by looking at a matching you know, parenthesis with a match function call so that it can implicitly decide about it. If not, then it will also look about the ambiguity if there is a multiple match. If not, it will give you an error saying, I do not understand the symbol. And if there is a global conflict, you will always use anonymous scope resolution to access them. And we also talked about namespace can be split across files, across uh, easy, and you can you know, exclude or include certain part of the build, which you think as a part of your application is needed or not. We also talked about versioning system. So aliasing of namespace can help you do the versioning and you can with minimal build changes, uh, you will be able to test your application across versions, right? That's the summary. Well, let's look at the design of uh, STL folks. So you guys can look into my room. I think we covered almost all of them. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, so design of STL is, uh, I just want to give you a small overview about the design by taking one or two examples of the design feature and show you how advantageous it is uh, to, to consume them, you know. So my focus here in this topic is going to be for all of you that, you know, start consuming STL rather than thinking about you writing and designing something and so and so on. That should be your later goal for sure. If you're writing modern application, and you're not using STL very effectively, I think then you aren't counting for modern application development. You know, I have seen top developers from top industry and uh, they carry 20 years experience, 15 years experience in their academics. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in the project, they are so tied up that nobody cares to get outside and dive, dive the inbuilt features uh, had they known they would have utilized this application in a more advantageous manner, you know. So my batting will be uh, more likely for for uh, the the consumption of STL and understand the design of it, you know, it, it really helps. So, yeah, hang on. I would like to see one more thing here. Yeah. So, you know, as you guys know, the design of STL is an approach of a decoupling system. Where you know, they under, you can think something like this, you know, that STL comprises of three major things. One is your, the container, which you can see here. And uh, the another one, which you call it is an algorithm. 
And the third thing which you see here is an iterator. When you talk about the container, they talk about having the data storages. So you can think these are for data storages. And algorithm are something which will act on the data. And then iterator, which acts as an interface between them. So most of the algorithm will be having the interfaces iterator. Now, why this was designed? Why can't we write algorithm for every container? The problem is that if you end up writing algorithms for every container, you have to multiply the implementation, like rewriting the same implementation for map or unordered map or set or unordered set or even maybe vector doubly ended queue or forward list or just a doubly linked list like list. I mean, it will be very weird for them to have simply increasing the you know, implementation. So they wanted to go against the object design principle. I just now said that the object design was based on what folks the coupling logic where we want to bring the data and methods together so we can guarantee by looking at this method that hey this method or interface was designed for only these kind of data you know so it becomes very easy of uh, ease of maintenance for my code bases extremely large code base ticket on cache but if you have a method which is to be agonistic to any particular data structure that is what we are talking about yeah, so C++ supports 70 algorithm from algorithm structure and 35 oh, from the numeric structure. And, and that is something which we should be you know, looking at. And, and to, to give you that design structure, that iterator is something which binds them together and they, they, they you know, call to each other. And the container talks about binding this data and they are again agnostic to the algorithm. They can exist with their member function initializers without be needing any algorithm. So again, iterator can be used to move across them without using any algorithm. You know? So that's the whole idea in the design, as you can see here, and trying to say that algorithms uh, focus not on containers, rather iterators by which it deals with con you know, containers and also work with templates for any other data types. As well. And these are some you know strong uh, set of uh, core components on its design, you know. And if you're working on, you know, STL headers, then these are the minimum headers requirement. Mostly it covers all of them, you know. So here you can see that numerics are the one which is the core for all the numeric related algorithm. They have some 35 odd algorithms. This is something 70 algorithms. So overall, you have 105 algorithms in C++. There are more 23 added variants in this in the newer versions and 17 will increase further uh, as in standard edition, but mainly there are variations. So having a knowledge of this 105 is like, uh, like a God's gift. You might think Google is a good choice, but you know, when it comes to being productive, if we would like you to know most of the functionality rather than, you know, not using it. If you're a C++ developer for 20 years or 10 years or 15 years, and you have not been working on this API, I mean, then it's a big question, what are we working on, you know? So an aspiration to know these knowledges helps you to do the job in 15 minutes rather than creating a scope of this for two hours or one hour. Because, you know, most of the time what we do is we go refer Google, then we test that application first, then we bring that same logic inside my actual code base and test it if it is working and so and so on. So every time we do this, we are roughly, you know, spending some 45 to one hour a day and that's roughly like, you know, uh, six to eight hours on a day every time browsing and you know just capturing them uh, rather than coming out with this as an experiment uh, and knowing about will only increase the productivity and so the, all the containers are categorized there are sequential containers and vector is a contiguous allocation but can be inserted only at the end and uh, popped also from end itself w ended queue as a direction service it can be added from both ends inserting in the beginning or something will be linear. L linked list is fantastic. Inserting anywhere is O of one because it's a doubly linked list. There's no contingency requirement. However, the search is still the same. Forward list link do not have any backlink available, just like singly linked list. This is added from C++ 11, okay? And if you compare, you know, vector is supposed to be fastest because it is of, because of contiguous memory location. Though, on the paper, if you look at, they are all O log n because it's a linear search algorithm. So always it will be O of n, but hardware may give some advantage to vector if they have cache and cache can always favor cache. 
you know, alignment heads. If you look at the another design, which is associative container, we talk about sorted order. So, you know, if you talk about binary trees, you know, balanced trees are something, an example of sorted trees, and they have O log N performance. So set or multi-set, map or multi-mat are the examples of it. Set does not accept, set and map do not have any duplicates. Set doesn't have any concept of data. The key itself acts like a data. However, map talks like key and a value. So usually a pair, which is taken as an input. A pair can be an object, pair can be a normal type, which you like, or can be another container type. And the key value is stored as if it is a, a hatching based concept. So you you have a subscript operator or act operator by which you can access and dereference them. Also, we talk about you know unordered associative containers. This is O of one. This is a newly in, in, in encapsulated uh, feature. So unordered set, unordered map, then unordered multi set, and unordered multi map. They use you know hash function to store the data. That's the advantage of using you know uh, the the unordered map because the search penalty is always based on the good hash function. However, there are chances of duplicates and you may end up becoming O of one because you might have collisions and you may store it as a linked list. So at some time, if you have a bad hash function written by you, which is a custom hash function, uh, you might be in trouble. So if you're unsure, I would say you can still go for an associative container. Though the search is a little slow, it is deterministic, 100% guarantee, irrespective of the size of N, you know? So that gives you a quick comparison sheet about all the STL design in C++. Folks, you know, it's a very, you know, short uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, session. So I might not be able to cover every aspects of it, but giving you one example here will make sense. Mubarak, how much time do I have? Yeah. Hello? Mubarak? Okay. So I would like to give you guys a quick overview about how this design is. By one example, I think it will give you some fair idea about it. So, yeah. So I'm using an Xcode here so that I can get some hints very quickly and build up a small project for you. I'm gonna use a Mac OS online, CPP, and one STL, free demo. Okay, I don't have it. So I just say command line next. Online CPP demo. Wonderful. As you can see, the code is uh, here, and uh, I'm just gonna actually include. Uh, demo STL and I just want to show you something here by saying the user namespace store and and then we add a more new file you know so absolutely here we need to say external void and a demo underscore STL so that's my function and I'm gonna use this in another file. So I'll say here, demo STL. All right. And let's write the definition here. We'll do this API. Just to show you, main is doing nothing, just calling this function. I'll be writing everything stuff here. So let's include, as you know, including vector is a requirement for us. I'm gonna use something called as a map, or maybe I'll use a, yeah, for an example, map, maybe, and algorithm, and then you can use, say, function, so function, functional. I think that should be enough, sufficing us, namespace for, and let's go for it. So let's look at, you know, first and foremost, I'll have to have a data, say, int 
I list of say something here, uh, which is okay. And I don't know how many elements one, two, three, three, six, two, eight. All right. And then I also will have something like uh, a TMP item. And I'm going to have the same size, say 336 plus 2, 8 of them. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going to show you something which is a small algorithm. As I said, you see, copy. Now, copy algorithm helps you to take the source and destination. So I'm going to say I list which is the starting address, it goes by iterator. And then I list plus eight, which is my end goal. And then I'll say I 10, you know. And now to print this, I might say something like print. Okay, so for auto or int i assign zero, I less than eight and plus plus i. Okay, I'm just going to see way here. And uh, uh, plus plus i, so more or less there. And see out, let's print item of i. And uh, you know, maybe a small comma. Let's decorate this a bit. Yeah, that's nice. And I want to also you see out array less than 10. And then let's start this, something like this. This is what we are looking for. And uh, you know, it's cribbing because of one of the very interesting key. Favorite error file is missing, folks. So it's I the stream is not there. My assistant in the editor is not happy about it. So suddenly is smiling, giving me a succeed message. There you go. Come on, show me this up. Can you guys see this on the screen? We got all the array copied in 10. Right now. Nice. <coughs> However, if I wanted to perform this for a vector, I would do that, say vector int and I can say a and again the same stuff here I can go with something I'm just trying to share this and yeah and now I can say something like bb or just here I can also have another vector say int say vb and uh, maybe we will take va dot size because I need the memory Otherwise, I need to use some other API like back insert or something that helps me. And then I use again a std copy. And then I say the same thing. Now I say va dot begin for start address. So you easy out there, va dot n. And then you say the vb, which is my temporary now, dot begin. And voila, it is working for me if I say for. Maybe in C11, we have some like auto keyword. And there's a new style for you. Say, say, I2VA. And I can always say, it can be on silent if uh, possible. I'm going to copy this here. And uh, okay. I, mm, yeah, and I can say I in dev. And no, in dev, I just wanted to give um, something like this and say R. Uh, again, put in this dub. And uh, yeah. Huh? I'll say vector list. <laughs> So there's somebody on not on silent Sagar. Can you mute yourself? It's not good. Thank you. And now you can see what's happening here. Awesome. Vector is also using the copy. So can we understand about the agnostic of data? What did I say? The algorithm's design is something 
where it doesn't care about who are you, whether you are a plain audience teacher, whether it is you are a vector or your map. I really don't care. Just copy. Now there are a lot of things which we can think of. You know, not only the data type matters here. I mean, tomorrow you can say something like, "Hey, let's have a more more vector," and say it says so the string takes inside, and I say S A, uh, which which again says something like one and then two and then three, and just bug things up. See, these all the syntaxes are deep, uh, eleven syntaxes because otherwise you have to keep saying push back, push back, push back, and so you may not work on that. So I'm just taking an example here, a short and our demo time. And um, you know, let's say in this B. Now at this time, when you're using a copy, you can perform the same copy stuff again here, you know. And all the thing is going to be here in S A, and here S A. Oh, now the difference is there is no size for S B. So, so you know that can be a problem. You know, as you can see, it's to the string. It doesn't even think about that as a type. Scope resolution the same. Now, you now what we don't want to do here is we want to say S B here, and you will see the program will crash in this case. Why? Because there is no size for S B allocated. The build has failed. Says I don't know this, and uh, let's let's go back here. And if you look at algorithm field, it's trying to you know increment the iterator, and it's unable to do that in the string here. You know, so sb dot begin, and it doesn't find the address right. Build succeeds, but the crash is there. Who says access? The bad access is coming up here. It gives me a prompt here. When I say BG, it takes me to the frame of a. It cracks my head, saying that somebody was trying to use an string for a copy. But I don't find enough memory on this, so it's coming back from frame to frame, and saying that there is something really serious, really wrong in allocation, and that's right. You remember in the previous example we had to allocate the SB memory, so we said V8 dot or item dot size something like this here. So in these scenarios we have something which is called as bad insert or is only for designed for vector, and then you can pass the container say SB. That's another way that you know you can keep incrementing when you're not sure about the source size. Suppose that you're getting it from some socket or some other files, and you're not sure of the size. Then dynamically back insert works fantastic. It keeps allocating and pushbacks. Keep allocating pushbacks. And now the example is perfectly fine. Mm, see, the problem here is I'm printing the old stuff. I should be printing SB here, and uh, that gives you SB. Awesome. So by this, what I'm trying to say is this: same algorithm is working not only for different types. And not only standard types, but your custom types also. And I think that's a, quite a small demonstration about a quick demonstration about the design of STM, where you know how algorithm can be living happily away, untouched from these uh, containers, but just taking the input in a way that you know their addresses are gained and being data agnostic. I think this is a very powerful aspect of how you design programs. Hope these guys. Uh, uh, Who you know designed uh, you know at least oh one you know approach from us because you know that is something which really changed the way we used to work on the data handling part you know in fact in 1995 when it was proposed uh, Strasburg was not very happy about having this as a part of C++ but not having it would have been you know C++ speaker speaker I mean the kind of jealousy others people have like Java they are so jealous about these features they have JSTL you know. Where all these collection classes and other things uses internal that to manipulate everything at runtime, but here things are even at compile time. So you know it's possible for you to change memory location policies. We can also hear about them in case if you are interested in taking up this kind of serious advanced in future. 
And we can also talk about, you know, how a custom allocator works, how a strategy works for this, how you can change the implicit parameters, how you can pass custom allocator techniques and so, and so on. However, for today, we'll just keep the stuff aligned over here. Mubarak, just want to check, do we have some more time or can I touch the one more thing? Yeah, yeah Nimesh, sure. Okay, folks, can we have 15 more minutes? I know I'm spilling over, but these topics are like never ending stuff, you know? We can keep talking, 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 and yeah. So can I take 15 more minutes? We go ahead, Mubarak, for threads, just to give them yeah, a word. Yeah. Yes, Anivesh. All right, thank you. So folks, uh, the third topic, which I was trying to give you a small overview about multi-threaded or concurrency application support in C++, you know, that is creating a raise out there. I mean, not knowing it and not practicing that, it means you are getting away from modernization rather than getting into the modernization. So C++ concurrency is getting stronger and stronger day by day. It has come out late. If you compare with C sharp, or if you compare that with, uh, if you look at, um, you know, OpenMP or Clicks projects out there from Intel, or even POSIX kind of implementation, there are a huge market. Uh, uh, which is built with a plethora of such projects on B thread and OpenMP and other stuff. But you know, writing in standardized code like Java, which uh, is doing a great job, and some of the markets stolen by Shishar uh, because of their dominance of uh, licenses in the world. Uh, C++ never had this in his nature. So if you compare, this is a very good time. They have come out late, but we are shooting up well. So, you know, a couple of slides on that saying that, you know, concurrency is something which is very interesting in C++ and we all must uh, uh, look to, you know, uh, upgrade ourselves on that line. As you know, concurrency is not something which directly can be architecture dependent and uh, platform dependent. Even virtual machines from Java interact uh, internally natively but you know all the idea is abstracted at a layer of api so you don't care about platforms or architectures so it's a good tie up from them and the implementation from sun that you know all the implementation goes in together as a va uh, without you caring about the platform specific stuff rather they tie up with the platform guys who can write the native vm for them and that that's it so i think c plus plus went this role with saying that, hey, let's start having the entire conversation. So I have one slide which will give the entire overview of this. Hope you guys will like this. So you know, if you look at this entire diagram, the, the first thing you will notice here is uh, I'm talking about the processes which are running on large on top. That's the user address spaces. Uh, guys, one sec, just hang on. So if you look at, you know, the processes we are talking about here, uh, the idea of you writing applications, which is uh, going to be agonistic of architecture. So if you look at a uni processor architecture, it means, you know, you have one CPU and one RAM here. They are trying to interact. This is the legacy ages. And then you can think of how the kernel is working and the kernel can be either Microsoft or it could be a, Linux or it could be a Mac. And then these OSs may abstract some thread architectures like CUDA or OpenMP or POSIX structure. And then there's a need for you to have a language abstraction where C++ comes in picture. So this wasn't available until C++ 11. But C++ 11 has solved this by saying that I will standardize a set of API which will deal in and provide you multi-threaded applications running. Traditionally, what happens is all the programs which runs, they either run on this kind of environment, which is a multi-processing environment. Multi-processing environment in the sense, every process has its own address spaces. The advantage of run running a multi-processing environment or achieving concurrency, whole idea is the same. Again, these processes will fork itself uh, on a machine 
and they will go and sit on the different uh, architectures like UME, uniform memory architecture, or non-uniform memory architecture. Only the difference is here you have a shared RAM across all the CPUs and timing is almost same. But here you have multiple nodes under which you interact on the hardware. So having multiple nodes, it leaves you uh, unpredicted physical time of access to the architecture. And you know, that's the, but there are techniques by which you can optimize them by moving the pages from one node to another. Node here means RAM. So if I look at a very high overview of this, that you know, processes run, and they also, multiprocessing can also be used for this, you know, uh, concurrency and also multi-threaded application. The difference is multi-threaded application is having a shared virtual address space. It means they are a part of a single EXE. Okay. So if any thread runs off, the program will kill or the model kind of boss and worker model. As long as boss is working, all the threads will be working. Boss is home, everybody home. So that's a multi-threaded model under which applications are designed. So RAM is very good. The advantage of that you have all the global resources being shared, but the problem is latency. So if you have something like to access from two, and if you have to talk and use communication, you don't need any communication technique. You can directly talk from one thread to another. But when you look at uh, multi-processor method, each processor takes a different address space. And then the advantage of this is that killing of or dying of one process still leaves the other part of the program running. So that's a good thing. But the idea is the RAM consumption. Say if on a 32-bit machine, a process is trying to achieve 4 g of memory, then if you have five processes, it is possible at some point of time, all the five may demand 4 g so roughly requ requiring a vertical RAM size for, right, 20 GB. Unlike, irrespective of the number of tasks or thread increases in a shared address space, the memory requirement is always going to be 4 GB. It's very memory sensitive, and because of sharing, you will have blocking problems. So what C++ is opening up is saying, you don't hell care about POSIX or OpenMP or CUDA or which Linux and Mac will be doing. I will be tying up with the standard suppliers they will provide me the native control and you guys can keep working on this application. You know? So just to give you an example of how threads can be designed and uh, can be worked, it's very easy to create threads on, uh, on C++. So I'll just add one small example here. You just include something like a thread and everything remains the same. I'm just gonna code comment this, folks. And uh, yeah, and then we say I use the same function so that you know I don't need to rewrite this. The simplest way to write a thread would be like say I have a function, say Kelsey, and it performs a simple C out and uh, and. I'll just say ready function. There's a nice debugging API called as ready function. It shows you from where you are, you know. So that's the thing. And how do I call this thread? I would say stun thread, say T, and I make a call to the Kelsey. That's my function name. And to ensure that the main is also working, I would say, can somebody mute themselves? Who's this? Yeah, thanks. Read me. Mute yourself, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I would say something like stood, C out in main, and then I'll have while one. Do nothing, spin here. This is good enough to see the message out there. As you can see, in main, and then you have void Kelsey. Why is the function name? Pretty function prints the name from where you come from. 
Suppose I, if I had a struct or a class, say demo, and here is where I had one uh, function, say sum, and I wanted to have still see how, and then I'll say underscore underscore play function in there. Now, if I want this function to be a part of uh, my thread creation, then I could also do that by saying std. So first, I create an object of demo, say o demo, and then I say another thread, say std thread, and then I will say tb in this case. Sorry, guys, not using very formal names. And then I want to use the address of this function, so I would say demo scope scope and the function name which is sum and then I can also say address of o demo and uh, of course in this case when we build this program I might see you can see Kelsey you can see you know uh, demo sum being printed in main so that's how you can route now you know, if you do not have this the behavior is undefined because you know if the mean gets killed uh, you don't know what's going to happen to those things. okay lucky you you got me in demo but Kelsey while printing somebody went on crash again let's run this again oh in me demo got killed another function could not Oh, luckily it's working, but still not. So what's very clear that, you know, once the main is out, there's no control. So main can wait for all the threads to go out by using a join mechanism. Very easy, th.join, enjoy. tv.join, enjoy. Now, both the threads will be watched for its completion before it finishes. So the moment I say join, you have threads. Absolute predictable program concept. Imagine if you had to pass some parameters, say int, and it y, and you wanted to have something like printed, uh, what do I have to decorate this, uh, is equal to, and then say x plus y, and that's it. So, so how do you pass that? Maybe here, something like this, and now we go for the next bit. Perfect. 45 and 12 make some 57. And that's what we wanted. And so thread is a very easy thing. And then, you know, we can keep going on and on. Very easy to write multi, you know, threaded program. And, you know, you can do a lot of stuff here. A lot of things going on. But I, I wanted to keep you guys uh, uh, engaged in some of the very short examples by which I can give you the ability about C++. Unfortunately, you know, being a demo program, I will have restrictions not to go uh, in, in more detail than I could have. But, uh, however, if you find it interesting, I think, and if you're really passionate about developing career for C++, I think you need to modernize yourself because, you know, uh, the kind of disruption is happening in the modernization uh, area. C++ has become a backbone for all the you know the the concepts which we are using over here and uh, yeah i think that that's uh, roughly you know covers up about some of the you know very basic uh, introduction to namespaces uh, a little bit about how program works on uh, uh, okay who's writing on the screen folks yeah so I think that, that will bring it to the end of my presentation. I hope you have got some insight about some overview about the design of STL namespaces in particular, and then also about the design of threads and the supporting. Okay. So now I'll open up the questions uh, for all of you. Uh, you can chat or you can unmute yourself, ask question, and I can take it up. Mubar, would you moderate me? Yeah, guys. Uh, any questions? Folks, feel free to ask any question. Not necessarily from here, anything on C++ is fine. 
Uh, Animus, can you stop recording here? Yeah, yeah, of course.